I want to say that with creation of languages that can cross borders, we are also passing on Pan-African connection and a sharing of Pan-African consciousness. So a lot of it has to do with the arts, the languages and so forth, and the power of the arts to communicate, to break borders. A lot of the seeds then were planted right here on Tanzanian soil, and now human bees are transporting the pollen from the flowering plants across Africa and around the globe. Wananchi, Melala. Okay. Before moving too far with my delivery, I think I should pause and elaborate a little bit on the main terms in my lecture topic, just to make sure that I'm not speaking to myself. You know what we conclude when we see someone speaking to herself or to himself, and I don't want to be committed here in Tanzania. So I would like us to have a conversation. I'm also reminded, of course, of the story of the blind men and the elephant. They were trying to describe different parts of the elephant, the same animal, but coming up with very different definitions. I know we have a discussion after this. And those blind men started fighting one another. I'm not ready for a fight with anybody. So let's see whether we can have a point of departure with these uh, definitions. And I want to begin with the last one, the concept of liberated zones, which I have been speaking about, and work my way backwards, crab-wise. Now, the concept of liberated zones emerges out of a history of struggle against slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, and imperialism. In physical terms, it refers to areas that enslaved and colonized Africans actually liberated either through armed struggle and bloodshed or through organized sittings when they were protesting during the civil rights movement. Under circumstances of struggle and self-defense, the activists would occupy spaces that they had taken back from the enemy, quote, and create model societies that replaced the repressive systems they were protesting against. They created new spaces in their own terms in an effort to rid themselves of the enslaving, colonizing ideas and practices that had been socialized into them as, a, as colonized people. And those institutions, those paradigms, those cultures of domination can be extremely enslaving when socialized in us. So in these cases then, the liberators would attempt to create new societies and new peoples, new systems, new political education systems, new artistic forms of self-naming, alternative and um, alternative media projects, democratic and participatory democratic practices, gender conscientization, so on and so forth. Now, during slavery, runaway enslaved people created what are known as free slave zones all over the Americas. In Jamaica, the zones forged were known as maroon societies, mostly up in the Blue Mountains, for those of you who have been in uh, Jamaica. And up to this day, remnants or descendants of the maroons still maintain a very active resistance culture against neocolonialism, capitalism, and imperialism. Like the Rastafarians, they embrace Africa as their ancestral home. Now, this presentation does not engage in a critique of some of the shortcomings of these social movements and these communities. In South America, these liberated zones were known as quilombos. And in the quilombos, there was usage of a lot of art and a lot of performing arts, a lot of dance, a lot of drumming, as well as spirituality that guided the people in the creation of their societies. Now, this is very important, what I'm going to say next. For perhaps the person who started the tradition of creating liberated zones was a woman 
that I hope some of you know about, especially those of you who are in history and political science, known as Queen Anne Nzinga of Angola. She created a liberated zone, fighting the Portuguese, released enslaved people who were there, and declared it free territory. So any enslaved person actually landed there was a free person. And this was amazing, and we are talking about 17th, 17th, 18th century. And this was a woman leader who started the creation of liberated slaves, Anne Nzinga. Please remember her. Tradition continued through slavery across in the Americas during the civil rights movement when liberation fighters occupied buildings and declared those sites liberated zones. We are talking of the Black Power Movement that built schools and nurseries and spaces for homeless people to have kitchens from where to eat. These were called liberated zones. We are talking of countries that actually liberated zones and started building the expected new future um, in there. We are talking of Algeria, of Mozambique, of Angola, Guinea-Bissau. All these people led the way in terms of liberated zones. So liberated zones are critical areas. And we want to ask ourselves today, what can the arts do in order not to just create them, but make them flower and bloom? Let us now go to the concept of art and artists and their role in society. And it's important we do this in order to understand how it is that they have the power and the talent to create liberated zones and cause flowering to happen there. Here we are speaking of art broadly as encompassing aspects of all imaginative creativity including music, oratory, and literature, and their genres, such as stories, poems, novels, drama, theatre, artifacts, sculptures, tie and dye, designing, dance, painting, carving, all those. Art is created as imaginative work to reflect upon life in an effort to capture in magical terms its beauty as well as its ugliness. Art is reality that is envisioned in such a manner that out of that vision emerges a new reality that is aesthetically appealing. In other words, this imaginative interaction with and reflection upon images and experiences of daily life transforms ordinary phenomena into uniquely extraordinary statements. The artist is therefore a person who is endowed with the gift of turning the familiar into a magical presence that appeals to the eye, to the ear, to the mind, and to the heart. Art is the outpouring of the soul. Within the black tradition then, art is very important. But art is not just created and consumed for aesthetic beauty. On the continent of Africa and the African diaspora, art has a functional purpose as well. The notion of art for art's sake, which was popularized by the Bohemian tradition, in which an artist is often viewed as transcending life and being a man or woman who is set apart from his community, creating on his own and suffering as a result because no one understands him or her. This is not anything that is acceptable. In fact, it is problematic. And let me say something about oracha for those of you who are not used to the term. By oracha, I mean the art of the spoken. For those of you who are in literature and in oracha and so on, you can take a nap, a short nap, while I educate the rest of the community who are not as lucky as we are. You know what I mean? Asomi. Are we together? Even though I've been insulting some of you. Okay, but really it's very important for us to understand this term because um, it, it, it's something recent in, in scholarship, in recent uh, decades. So origin is the art of the spoken word that culminates in performance. 
and it is consumed by the majority of black masses here on the continent but also in the diaspora because a lot of people don't have the money to buy books or the leisure to sit and read. So the spoken tradition in the form of stories and poems and all these is very, very important. Now, in the Orichat tradition then, the artist is one with the people. In fact, artists are actually supposed to be a part of the community and to know the community so well that they can articulate the feelings and the needs and the desires of that community. And the community is also supposed to know the artist, so when the artist represents them, they can trust that they are being properly represented. So then, in all Richard, the idea of an artist who stands aloof over and above his or her people is not a familiar thing. And in actual fact, it is something troubling, as I say. Again, to talk about art and liberated zones, and to show the role that East Africa has played in academic discourse. This term was actually coined in the corridors of the universities of Uganda, Makerere, Nairobi, and Dar es Salaam. When in the 70s and 60s we had scholars who were very creative and who dared um, define reality differently. And the people who actually promoted this term were Pio Zirimu and Austin Bukenya from Makerere University, even though all of us had participated in the college. And they presented a paper at First Act 77, the same forum as Wadi Shoinka was suggesting that Kiswahili should be the lingua franca of Africa. And it is developing as uniquely independent of um, literature. This is why for those of you who are students of Oricha, please try not to call it African literature, I mean, uh, or tradition, what do they call it, oral literature. Don't call it oral literature because it begs the term and opens a license to be judged in terms of literature. It is all richer. So Pio Zirimu and Bukenya said literature in Latin means the written imaginative word. So all Richard will now become the spoken word. So it's independent, the aesthetics is developing, scholarship is developing around it, and there are even dissertations, PhD dissertations in the area. Another area of art that has created liberated zones in the academy that is very, very important. So let me go on and suggest and mention now a few writers who have spoken about this role of art that creates, that creates liberated spaces. We have Chinua Achebe, who in his book of essays, Morning Yet on Creation Day, has a very famous essay called The Novelist as Teacher. And in this essay, he argues that the novelist or the teacher or the, art, the artist should play the role of the teacher in remaking the world that has been devastated by colonial stereotypes and misrepresentation. And he gives the example of a little boy who was in his wife's class and the wife asked them to write something exciting about weather in Nigeria. Weather in Nigeria that they had experienced. And this little boy, who had never been out of Igbo land, let alone Nigeria, wrote about snow and winter. And when Dr. Christy Achebe asked him, why are you writing about this subject that you know nothing about? And he said, well, you know, um, that's what we do in scholarship, kind of, you know. And then went on to say something like, his colleagues will laugh at him if he doesn't write about something fashionable or something you know, that comes from abroad and so on. So you can begin to see the sense of shame in our roots, our cultures, and therefore the need, as Achebe says, for the artist to try and help, especially the younger generation, to understand why it is important to root themselves in their culture. And I do understand that all cultures have got negative moments. And those negative moments we must be critical of. 
but all cultures have some negative moments and progressive moments. So again, I'm not going to go into that debate here. And then I want to share with you the words of James Baldwin, the African-American writer, who in notes of a native son said that the role of art is to squeeze meaning out of life and to squeeze every drop of meaning out of the experiences, whether they are bitter or sweet. Now, the role of the artist in the African continent today is to realize that there are some really sad things happening on the continent, but also to remember that there are moments to celebrate and to learn to squeeze meaning out of these experiences, making them coherent, analyzing them, so that people can begin to live with the reality that is facing them. Squeezing meaning out of especially bitter experiences can help us to understand, quote, where the rain began to beat us. Again, quoting from Chinua Achebe, and he wrote his book, The Man Died in Prison, on toilet paper and was, um, you know, um, smuggling the paper out to write that work. And we know other people have done it, including our brother, Abdul Latif Abdallah here, Ngogi Wathiongo, Dennis Brutus, and so on. And again, these are moments to celebrate when people who are locked up are actually rebelling and saying, you cannot lock up my imagination. I'm going to liberate those areas that I was liberating right here where I am. And this is why Ezekiel Mpaklele said, the writer is the sensitive needle of his or her society. And therefore, whatever comes with it, the writer has got to deal with. Wale Shoyinka in The Man Died said, I quote, the man dies in each one of us who keeps silent in the face of oppression. I might engender that and say the human being dies in each one of us who keeps silent in the face of oppression. And there is a Canadian poet, even though he's not a Pan-Africanist, who also has said something very profound. The line between humankind the angel and humankind the beast is tissue thin. So that human beings are perfectly care capable of being animals and beasts. In fact, I shouldn't say they are capable of being animals because sometimes animals are very civil to one another. And some of the crimes that have happened on this continent show a bestiality that you cannot even begin to explain. What is happening in the Congo today, for instance, with rape being used as a weapon of war, and this rape happening to three-year-old kids, and to 72-year-old women. And then, after rape, a lot of the, the, being gang raped, they shoot the gun into them. Now, this is war, and we are talking of war and how you defeat your enemies. And so, among the women of Congo, especially in the area around Chicago, they are using art to heal at a clinic where there is a very heroic doctor who is looking after them, reconstructing their reproductive parts, sometimes having to do six reconstructions in one person. And the sad thing is, after these women have been violated the way they have been, and they go home, they are also rejected by members of their families, sometimes by their husbands, and by the communities around them. Can you imagine greater isolation? So they are using art, they are using song and dance and drumming in order to encourage each other and to form communities where Oricha helps them to have conversation with themselves. And one of the songs that they have come up with is really touching. They say, you may destroy and tear apart everything I have, but you cannot touch my soul. You cannot touch my humanity. This is what art, if we are serious about the work we are doing, should be doing. Creating these liberated zones, especially among people who have suffered. I have talked about women, 
and perpetration of rape against them. But you know, it's also happening to little boys, increasingly so, in these societies and in these zones. Another writer, Amateidu of Ghana, has spoken of the need for artists to cure themselves and their society of self-imposed amnesia and to engage in the process of consciously remembering because one of the things that colonialism does is to really help us to forget and not to remember. Because to remember is to reflect. And to reflect and discuss may mean taking action in order to seek agency. So it's not a very popular option, but I'm a take to a saying, art must force us to remember. And when we remember, we have to act on this memory. Wasom, are you still here? Yes. In this regard, Okelo Chuli, a Ugandan poet and political scientist, has also said something very important. And he has talked about the need of art to explode silences in life. And I have taken this metaphor further by saying, yes, it's OK to explode silences in life, but some silences are positive. Self-chosen silence is positive because it may, it may have to do with reflection, with a retreat in order to regroup. But imposed silence is silencing. And therefore, explosion of negative silences is something that art and artists must do in order to create liberated zones. And in this world of creating liberated zones in Oricha, my story is our story, and her song is their song. This is a very communal way of producing. Again, I do want to say there are backward moments in Oricha, like celebration of war, like some of the praise of, you know, uh, warlords and, and, and all kinds of things and so forth. But I also want to say that today I'm not going into that kind of analysis. I'm just saying it's a site that is problematic like any other site that has problems, but it is one to embrace. I think I'm going to go pretty quickly and skip some of the um, you know, points that I was going to make because I think I can see a few people dozing. Wananchi, are you dozing? I'm teasing you, no one is dozing. I didn't see anybody. There is a writer from the Caribbean by the name of Nubezi Philip. And Nubezi Philip writes a book called She Unties Her Tongue. She Unties Her Tongue. And in this work, she is talking about the importance of language as art and the importance of liberating it so that it can untie our tongues. She is saying that languages of domination tend to tie our tongues especially when they begin telling us what is correct English, correct French, and what is accepted and standard and all kinds of things. And yet we are people who are English and French and Portuguese, second language speakers. And so our accent, as it were, renders us unlinguistic. And so Nubizi is saying that artists must liberate the world and must liberate language and tying tongues so that people can say what they want to say. Here she is with Amy Césaire, the writer of Return to My Native Land from Martinique, who talked about the importance of exploding silences and articulating reality. And as a person who was returning from France and going back to Martinique, he embraced what he saw and he gave the sites new names. I want to say river, I want to say tornado, I want to say, and he renamed the entire landscape. And what we have to do is seize agency to name our landscapes and not let others do it. Because institutions of domination and colonial assimilation are very good at abducting our agency. So Césaire poetizes Martinique and he makes it flower. 
I would like us to poetize our countryside, our spaces, wherever we are, our rivers, our mountains, and so on, so that they are blooming with flowering. I would like to see emergence of a culture in which there is pride in this self-naming. I want to end or come to an end by talking about the notion of a return. And this notion of return is nowhere more clearly theorized and articulated than in Amilka Cabral's Return to the Source. But Amilka Cabral's Return to the Source is one of those books that is like a manifesto to me. And I read it from time to time, the same way as Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask, and The Wretched of the Earth. There are books you have to keep coming back to. And in this work, he emphasizes the centrality of culture in the liberation process, clearly demonstrating that the two are intertwined because culture produces language and art. Art and language articulate culture and naming. The colonizers repress, demonize, and systematically destroy the cultures of colonized peoples deliberately because in so doing, the former is also able to destroy the colonized people's history as well, and so manipulate their identity. This explains why, as Cabral argues, the study of liberation struggles shows that in general, they are preceded by an increase in cultural phenomena. And Franz Fanon has persuasively argued in The Wretched of the Earth how, in actual fact, enslaving culture can just be as serious as occupation of physical space. He, in fact, argues that the, colonizing, the colonization of the mind is harder to get rid of because what really happened is that we become socialized into oppression and begin policing ourselves and sometimes even excusing the oppression perpetrated against us. So then, in creating liberated zones, they are arguing that culture is critical and art is part of that culture. Because if we don't liberate culture, it is invaded space and therefore we cannot really create liberated ground. Paulo Freire, another theorizer, from um, um, Freire is from Brazil. Brazil. He really is an educator whose work you ought to read. And if you haven't read at least uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, please make sure you read it before the next major event in your life. For those of you who are hoping to get married, read it before you get married. And those of you who are graduating, read it before you graduate. And whatever mischief you are up to, please read this work before you go ahead, because it's critical in defining some of the spaces we are talking about. So very quickly, I just want to run through selected examples of where some of these spaces were created. During slavery, enslaved Africans defiantly used music, songs, drama, storytelling, dance, drumming, drawing, sculptures, murals, and other artistic forms to rebel, agitate, communicate, educate, and claim freedom. Through art, they created metaphorical and physical liberated spaces. Moving forward, we can say that enslaved people also in the diaspora have been really big creators of art forms that are now becoming global. And I'm thinking of music in particular. And music has come with its own culture, some of it positive, other not positive, and so forth. But black culture is spreading through music from the Americas. And I want to argue that when enslaved people were taken across the Middle Passage and out into those plantations, they would never have survived if they not carried with them the orators that they took from Africa. They would not have survived if they had not created new orators of their own to talk of their reality. They would not have survived if they hadn't had artists and a notion of art that taught them to use it 
in order to liberate themselves. A notion of art that talked about art as having a function. One of the major creations that really helped the abolitionist movement to move forward were the classical slave narratives. And these were created first in orator form, stories being told between one enslaved community and the other, one person and the other. And then they went into books and they were used in order to campaign for ending slavery. These writings and these art forms and so forth are what W.E.B. Du Bois calls a part of the soul of black folk in that famous book of his. I want to argue that some of the greatest moments are the liberation struggles, and I can go through them. I will just mention spaces like Kenya, like Algeria, places like Mozambique, places like Angola, places like Guinea-Bissau, and so on, where music and song and dance were used in order to mobilize and in order to conscientize. In South Africa, we all know those children of Toeto and that toy toy dance, and the workers and their organization doing the gambling is an image we can forget. The songs of Miriam Makeba and the way they traveled across the uh, globe in order to internationalize the struggle against apartheid. Dennis Brutus and his poetry and his boycott of sports under apartheid. In fact, there is a book that summarizes what I'm trying to say that came out of the struggles of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. It's a poetry book called When Bullets Begin to Flower. In that front where there were bullets killing, artists were creating new life and new hope. They were creating new stories, stories of life and stories of liberation. When Bullets Begin to Flower by Margaret Dickinson. And I want to suggest if you teach poetry, that is a lovely book of poetry to teach. I want to mention two more things and then I will be finishing. And the first one has to do with the fact that when Zimbabwe became independent, and I was there, one of the biggest projects that was undertaken was the promotion of culture. And there were workshops and money was poured into it. Literacy was engaged upon art forms such as sculpting, art forms such as painting and so forth were promoted. And the government financed them. Of course, the story of Zimbabwe and what has happened since is very sad and I'm not going to go into it. But the reason that I'm mentioning Zimbabwe is to say that, like Amilka Cabral, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere was very clear about the need to return to the source. If we are truly thinking of liberating our culture and our forms from foreign grip, Referring to the class of colonial educated people, privileged elites, Mwalimu said the following, I quote, we can try to cut ourselves from our fellows on the basis of the education we have had. We can try to carve out for ourselves an unfair share of the wealth of society. But the cost to us, as well as to our fellow citizens, will be very high. Please remember this, it will be high not only in terms of satisfaction for God, but also in terms of our own security and well-being. Most unfortunately, this does not appear to have been heeded. For today, Tanzania follows the neoliberal path spearheaded by the class that Mwarimu was addressing in this quotation. In turn, this has meant the marginalization of non-material wealth dimensions of the country's development, including cultural and artistic funding. Unless we forget it, that great scholar from Trinidad who was here at this university, Walter Rodney, reminded us that the biggest resource in development is the human person. And that human person 
is nourished and created and enriched by cultural expression. And if we forget the value of human resources, if we forget to evaluate wealth and development in other terms, not just the dollar, not just the shape, I think that we are at peril. Mwalimu's now famous December 10th, 1962 Tanzania, address to the Tanzanian parliament entitled Culture is the Soul of the Nation, rationalizes his decision to create a ministry of national culture and youth. He pronounced, I quote, culture is the soul and the spirit of any nation. That was Mwalim Julius Nyerere, your own very president whom we are commemorating here today. He continued to assert, and I quote, a country that lacks its own culture is no more than a collection of people without the soul that makes them a nation, close quotes. W.E.B. Du Bois, writer of Souls of Black People, would agree with this. Walter Rodney would agree with this. I agree with it, and I hope that you too do. Mwalimu was known for walking the talk to use a black English African American expression. He created spaces for artists to produce art and for art to thrive. His speeches, especially at the inception of national independence, revisited the question of culture time and again. Mwalimu was fascinated by creativity and he was a creator himself. He was enthralled by artistic performance. I believe that under his presidency, Tanzania must have been the first country to introduce music, culture, fine art, and the performing arts as examinable subjects into the school system at primary and secondary school level. A great deal has been written about Mwalimu and his love for the arts. Some of the scholars, in fact, who have done work in this area include my long-time old friends, again, not old in terms of ancient, um, Amandina Lihamba and Penina Mlama and others, so I will not dwell on it. I will finish by saying that Ali Mazrui talks about the concept of philosopher kings and names African presidents and leaders who are artists and argues that a lot of them were humane because they had the artist in them. But he also agrees that some of them became some of the worst dictators, even though they were artists. But I find it a very fascinating theory, the philosopher king that touches people like Mwalim Julius Nyerere, Senghor, Azikiwe, Agostino Neto, he wrote beautiful poetry. Marcelino Dos Santos, another beautiful poet. Kenan Banana, an incredible poet. And Tabo Mbeki. And so we are saying yes, philosopher kings. We are saying yes, ordinary people. We are saying yes, orator artists. We celebrate today. Today we celebrate the legacy of this great son of Tanzania. And as we do so, I want us to ask ourselves, what are we doing to keep his legacy alive? Because we have become very good at celebrating and eating and drinking and feasting to remember heroes and sheroes. But the question is, what are we doing in order to create a different history?